Hi everyone, welcome to meeting number 17 of the M2D2 series. We are excited to have Kier with us today um, to learn about how to handle molecular, molecular chirality while learning 3D representations. Um, Kier Adams is a PhD candidate advised by Professor Connor Coley at MIT. His research interest centered around improving 3D representation of molecules in neural architectures with an emphasis on molecular reality, space, and sterics. Um, he seeks to apply 3D representation learning and deep generative modeling to enable new machine learning approaches in drug discovery and chemical catalysis. Thank you, Kev, for accepting our invitation and come, coming to present your, your work today and looking forward to, to it. Hey, thank you, Renancio. Uh, well, hello everyone. Uh, thank you to the Valence team for inviting me to present my recent work. As Prudencia mentioned, my name is Kier Adams and I'm a second year PhD student at MIT. Um, today, I'm very excited to share uh, our recent work on learning 3D representations of molecular chirality with invariance to bond rotations, which is kind of the first project out of my PhD co-authored by myself, um, Lucky Patanik and Connor Coley. Uh, just to give a brief personal background on myself, uh, I'm a second year candidate in, in chemical engineering and computational science and engineering at MIT. Um, and my research primarily revolves around 3D geometric deep learning, uh, 3D representation learning, molecular chirality, and deep general modeling, as Prudencia mentioned. Uh, but prior to my PhD work, I obtained my BS in chemistry and molecular engineering from the University of Chicago, um, where I did a variety of research projects in, in chemistry and uh, material science. So I come from a chemistry background, not necessarily a, a computer science background, um, just something to keep in mind. Uh, I'm always looking to connect with more people in the realm of machine learning for molecules and AI for science. So feel free to reach out through email, Twitter, LinkedIn, or the M2D2 Slack channels, which I just joined. Uh, it's really great, I think, to see a community kind of being formed out of these seminar series. And I think it's really valuable to kind of early career researchers such as myself. Oh, but yeah, let's just go, uh, let's get started. So insofar as an outline of this talk goes, I'll first kind of give a, a very brief uh, mini overview of geometric deep learning on molecules, since I'm not quite aware of all the backgrounds for those in the audience. Uh, this will include kind of a very brief introduction on graph neural networks for molecular representation learning, uh, specifically touching on the differences between 2D and 3D graph neural networks. And kind of this will also include a discussion of kind of the key molecular invariances we have to take into account when doing 3D representation learning. I'll then dive into tetrahedral chirality, which is will be the core focus of this talk. And this kind of lead us into a fairly detailed discussion about the chiral expressivity of current state-of-the-art 3D graph neural networks, uh, where, we'll, where we will specifically address the question of whether current 3D graph neural networks are sufficient to learn chiral representations of chiral molecules. I'll then discuss how we have designed our own scheme to enable a model to specially learn kind of the, the structural effects of chirality uh, and by processing kind of the, this, the 3D geometric information captured by the torsion angles of a molecular conformer. So this will kind of motivate our new neural network architecture, which I call Cairo or the chiral interrotoinvariant invariant neural network, um, which kind of implements our special geometric processing scheme. And lastly, I'll discuss some of the experiments we've designed to kind of benchmark Cairo against other graph neural networks when particularly tasked with uh, uh, learning chirality dependent properties of chiral molecules. So my talk is pretty, I guess, interdisciplinary at times. And when I've given versions of this talk before, there's always questions from, though, from those maybe with core deep learning uh, backgrounds, but who may be completely unfamiliar with chirality and vice versa. So really feel free to interrupt at any point to ask kind of clarifying questions, but hopefully we'll also have time at the end for a more detailed Q&A. So before diving in, uh, let's just begin with a very simple question. Uh, what is molecular representation learning? I gather that most of us are probably familiar uh, with representation learning, but for those who are not, uh, the essential kind of motivating idea is that uh, behind molecular representation learning is to use kind of deep learning algorithms to learn a continuous representation of discrete chemical space. So as a chemist or material scientist, I or we often think about molecules as discrete graph-like structures that are kind of built up from a core chemical scaffold, uh, but have various functional groups that confer specific electronic or, or um, steric properties to the molecule. And while this view is fairly intuitive, kind of this discrete nature of chemical space, chemical space uh, makes the computer-assisted design and optimization of novel functional molecules very difficult 
And that's because of molecular modeling essentially becomes a discrete and combinatorial problem. So if we could somehow instead encode discrete molecules into a continuous representation, uh, then we can more easily use statistical machine learning modeling techniques to say, accelerate high throughput virtual screens of target molecular properties such as drug potency, or we could enable the computer assisted uh, design and optimization of novel uh, chemicals or molecular materials. So kind of molecular representation learning is wholly concerned with kind of designing methods of encoding this continuous representation of chemical space to facilitate all these important downstream applications. Of course, this creates kind of a natural question. How do we actually go about uh, encoding this rich representation of, of molecules that kind of captures all that important and meaningful chemistry? Well, with kind of all machine learning, I think we will require two things. We'll first require a sufficiently large data set of molecules that are potentially labeled with properties of interest. And we'll need this to in order to train our kind of data-driven learning algorithms. But for this presentation, I will largely assume that we have, or at least can generate such a data set, and instead focus on the second requirement, which is that we need to develop deep learning uh, models, typically neural networks, that can express or learn uh, complex and subtle chemistry from the, from the provided chemical data. So kind of the typical deep learning models that have been designed to learn these kind of chemistry-informed continuous representations uh, molecules are the so-called graph neural networks, which essentially just model a molecule as a, dis as a discrete 2D graph consisting of atoms as nodes and bonds as edges between nodes in the graph. And at kind of the highest level, a graph neural network can simply be considered as a kind of a data-driven, highly parameterized nonlinear function that maps a graph representation of molecule to a set of vectors that encode the local chemical environments around each atom in, in the molecule. And while the algorithmic procedure or the mathematical procedure behind graph neural networks can seem a bit complicated, there's really nothing more than just a way to embed each atom in the molecule into a learned feature representation or node state that kind of captures the local chemical environment around that atom. So mathematically, what we'll do is that we're first going to simply embed node states using kind of user uh, defined features of the atom, such as atom type, mass, formal charge, whatever the chemist thinks is important to directly input into the model to represent what an atom is. Then for kind of each layer, what's called message passing, we are going to update that representation of that node or atom in the graph by first collecting or aggregating information about the local chemical environments from the surrounding atoms, and then update that central node state using this local chemical information. And kind of through this learned sequence of data-driven processing of this molecular graph, we can we can embed continuous representations of the atoms, which can then be kind of pooled together, added or max pooled, whatever, whatever you want to use uh, to get a continuous representation of the entire molecule. Uh, so then that's kind of just a brief uh, overview of molecular representation learning in a nutshell, where we kind of just go from this discrete molecular structure into this continuous vector describing the molecule in a learned latent space. So what I've just described is a 2D graph neural network, which really only operates on the 2D graph representation of a molecule consisting of nodes and edges between nodes. Of course, uh, we know that molecules aren't really flat objects, uh, but they're actually uh, real 3D structures with geometric or steric properties. Uh, so we may want to actually use this 3D geometry of a molecular conformer or structure, which is kind of captured by the atomic coordinates. Um, and we want to use this 3D a geometry in order to augment our molecular representations in order to capture both the local chemical and spatial environments around each atom during message passing. Uh, however, when we switch from a kind of a 2D graph neural network to a 3D graph neural network, we have to think about how best to feed that 3D geometry into the deep learning model. For instance, maybe naively encoding the Cartesian coordinates of each atom may be a relatively poor modeling decision, since simply translating or rotating our, the molecule in space, which doesn't actually affect its properties, uh, that would kind of drastically impact the model's learned representation of that molecule. So in maybe deep learning terminology, we need to embed geometric representations that kind of respect key molecular invariances. So that the model's embeddings are invariant to or unchanged by kind of simple transformations of the input 3D structure. So kind of the main two molecular invariances that have become a de facto standard for existing 3D graph neural networks are invariances to global translations 
in global rotations of the 3D molecular conformer, uh, which really just change the reference frame with which you look at the molecule, but don't actually change the conformational pose or the 3D geometry of that molecule. So no matter how we look at a molecule, its properties are going to remain the same. So we, we want our 3D neural networks to learn a representation that is at least SE3 invariant to translations and rotations in order to ha avoid having to perform maybe costly data augmentation during training in order to kind of teach the model this, this 3D invariance during training. The next invariance that is often really lumped together with global translations and rotations are global reflections of the conformer, which just reflect each of the atom's coordinates through a mirror plane. And this E3 invariance, which is really quite common in 3D graph neural networks, uh, may seem to be quite curious or strange to those of you more familiar with chemistry, since reflecting a chiral molecule will actually invert the chiral centers and, and thus actually change the molecular identity. Therefore, being invariant to reflections will make, will make the model invariant to chirality and unable to distinguish between any isomers. Uh, so um, breaking this E3 invariance to learn chiral molecular properties will be a key theme kind of throughout this presentation, but we'll, which we'll discuss a lot more on, on later slides. This is just a brief taste. And so a last invariance that really hasn't been considered too much, if at all, in the kind of the realm of molecular invariances for geometric deep learning is what I call interroto invariance or invariance to how internal molecular bonds in the conformer are rotated. So obviously rotating these internal molecular bonds will change the conformational structure or the 3D geometry of the molecule. But if you're not learning conformer dependent properties, but instead learning molecular properties in general, then these different conformations are really just different representations or views of the same object. And so we may want it to actually be invariant to um, these different yet arguably equivalent interconvertible structures. And so this kind of raises the question of why or when might it be important to kind of treat this conformational flexibility inside a neural network model. And kind of a key application of graph neural networks is drug activity prediction, where we wish to predict the interaction between a candidate drug and a protein target. Um, however, unfortunately, oftentimes we don't actually know kind of a priori the bioactive or bound conformer pose of that particular drug ligand. So shown here, let's see if it plays, it's kind of a nice visualization of how a molecule may take on a range of different conformations. Uh, in, order, in order to best settle into its best geometry that kind of best binds this particular protein pocket. And since we might not know this kind of ultimate binding pose, uh, being able to explicitly model conformational flexibility of that molecule inside our 3D representation would maybe allow us to better capture these uncertain like and protein uh, interactions. A second example uh, where conformational flexibility is important is in the modeling of Boltzmann averages, such as solvation energies. And these kind of Boltzmann averages really depend on a distribution of conformations. So maybe just sampling and using one conformer from that entire distribution in order to predict the distribution's properties uh, may be quite limiting. So if instead you're able to model, naturally model the molecules conformational flexibility, you may have a uh, better chances of, of modeling these bolts and averages. And lastly, and this is very specific to molecular representation learning on chiral molecules, but if we use neural networks to model the effects of molecular chirality uh, using kind of 3D molecular structures as our input representations, then these 3D networks can get easily confused between differences in conformational structure versus differences in the actual chiral identity of stereoisomers. So, so somehow disentangling these two facets, conformational differences versus chiral differences, uh, could really help us isolate the effects of molecular chirality in our downstream applications. So if you can naturally take into consideration conformational flexibility, then you are naturally more expressive toward tetrahedral chirality or chirality in general. So this kind of brings us to our main topic of the day, uh, touch hedral chirality. Uh, what is it and why is it kind of important? Um, well, just as our kind of our hands are essentially non-superimposable mirror images of each other, uh, molecules also have a kind of structural handiness called molecular chirality that can strongly influence uh, molecular properties. 
And while there are kind of many complex forms of molecular chirality out there, kind of tetrahedral chirality is by far the most common form. Um, and if you've ever taken an organic chemistry class, you're probably well familiar with tetrahedral chirality. Uh, so just bear with me. Uh, but kind of at its most uh, basic definition, uh, tetrahedral chirality kind of describes how the spatial orientations of four non-equivalent groups uh, around, uh, around a chiral carbon center uh, differ from molecule which, molecules which otherwise have the same exact uh, 2D graph connectivity or isomorphic. So in this visualization, you can see how these two different molecules have different local orientations of these red, blue, and green groups around the central carbon atom. Uh, so no matter how we rotate this molecule or no matter how we rotate this central carbon-carbon bond, we cannot interconvert these compounds. In fact, we can only interconvert these compounds, uh, if, uh, which are called enantiomers, by reflecting these, the 3D coordinates through a mirror plane. And this is because tetrahedral chiral centers are inverted upon reflection. So that's tetrahedral chirality, but why is it important? And the general answer to this question is that whenever a chiral molecule interacts with a chiral external environment, such as a protein pocket, a tetrahedral chirality can be critically important for defining the physiochemical properties of that interacting system. So for instance, here are three FDA approved drugs whose tetrahedral chiral centers, which are highlighted in red, uh, kind of play a critical role in determining the drug's therapeutic properties. While a particular enantiomer of each of these drugs uh, may confer the desired properties, uh, inverting the chirality of these molecules could cause these drugs to be either inactive, less active, or even toxic to the patient. So uh, tetrahedral chirality is, is, is really important in, in, drug, in drug design. And so kind of as small of a structural detail tetrahedral chirality may initially seem, it can actually be kind of the deciding factor in kind of real world biochemical applications. So knowing that tetrahedral chirality can be critical, how do we properly account for it and learn it to encode chirality sensitive representations of molecules? Uh, the sensitivity of neural networks to chirality really, de really depends on those key molecular invariances that I, that I touched on uh, before. So first I'll briefly mention that neural networks that only kind of operate on 2D graphs, which are in fact most graph neural networks, uh, these 2D graph neural networks, networks kind of ignore 3D geometry entirely and therefore will be completely invariant to molecular chirality. And this is because again, chiral molecules are isomorphic or have the same exact 2D graph connectivity. So a 2D, a 2D graph neural network will be unable to learn the effects of chirality. Uh, moving on to 3D models, we have E3 invariant networks or E3 invariant 3D networks, which are invariant to reflections and therefore also fundamentally unable to distinguish between mirror image and enantiomers, even though these 3D networks may be able to distinguish, different di distinguish between different conformations of the same molecule, they're unable to distinguish mirror images. So then we also have SE3 invariant 3D models, which are not invariant to reflections. And therefore these SE3 invariant models should in principle be should in principle be able to, to distinguish between enantiomers with differing chirality um, uh, from their 3D molecular structures. However, as we'll see in a, in a couple of slides, uh, because SE3 invariant 3D networks are also very sensitive to conformational variations, uh, they may get easily confused by simple conformational changes uh, when attempting to distinguish different enantiomers with different chiral identities uh, from their 3D structures. And so lastly, we have the types of models that I will introduce in this talk, which are SE3 invariant, but also interroto invariant. So these 3D models will, will distinguish enantiomers, but they're also going to be invariant to all those confounding bond rotations that don't actually change the chiral identity of the molecule, and thus actually have a, a greater ability to encode robust chiral representations of molecular structures. Um, I have a, a question in the chat from Prudencio, which I'll briefly mention now. Uh, he asks, in 2D models, we can encode chirality in no, node representations. Yes, that's right. So that's what kind of the workaround that practitioners use to, to uh, maybe inject chirality into their models. In, they, they, in, in the node attributes, they encode chirality as maybe binary flags. Think of R versus S, one hot encodings of, of, the, of, of, the, of, of, of the chiral nodes. But um, 
the I will show my in my empirical experiments while this while why this is kind of underperformant, but the kind of the general idea is that these are essentially binary flags of chirality, and they aren't they aren't particularly powerful. The model isn't going to be able to learn the like the fundamental uh, uh, structural effects of chirality. Uh, it's really just something. Um, it's just a, a small signal that the molecule can attempt to learn from. So that's why this, this talk is focused on kind of learning 3D representations of chirality rather than 2D representations of chirality. Uh, so maybe to ground this discussion just a little bit, what are some concrete 3D models that are currently available to the ML community uh, for molecular representation learning and how sensitive are they to chirality? So first up, we have kind of the Schnett-like models that simply use pairwise atomic distances to inform message updates to node states during message passing. And because these Euclidean distances between pairs of atoms are unchanged upon reflection, distances in 3D space are unchanged upon reflection, this means that Schnett is an E3 invariant model and thus cannot distinguish between enantiomers with any reliability. Uh, Next up, we have the 3D models like DimeNet, which also encode bond angles in addition to atomic distances in their message passing updates. But like bond distances, bond angles are also unchanged upon reflection. And thus, these types of models are also E3 invariant and E3 invariant, and thus also cannot distinguish between near image enantiomers. And so lastly, we have the 3D models such as SphereNet or GemNet, which also consider the torsions or dihedral angles of a molecular conformer. <clears throat> and because they consider torsion angles and not just bond angles or bond distances, uh, these models become SC3 invariant and thus should be able to distinguish between conformers with differing chirality, at least superficially. And so this kind of brings us to a key question of this presentation. Are torsion angles, are torsions enough to learn chirality? Well, reflecting a conformer through a mirror plane will negate all the torsions or all the dihedral angles in the conformer. This is kind of a geometric property. And because enantiomers are mirror images, this means that if a model has access to all the torsions of a molecular structure, that model should be able to learn the effects of chirality. However, I'm going to emphasize that simply having access to all the torsions in a, in a molecule does not make the model robust or expressive when learning chirality. In fact, 3D models can get easily confused between differences, uh, can, get, can get really confused between conformational changes near the chiral center uh, versus differences in the actual underlying chirality of the molecule. Uh, so take, for example, this a simple like, empirical experiment or a challenge of 3D, the SE3 invariant 3D model SphereNet to distinguish or cluster the latent representations of enantiomers with inverted chirality. So in this experiment, I, am, I initially embed four to five conformers, each of these two enantiomers into a, into a learned latent space, but then manually rotate the bonds near the chiral center for each of these conformers. And while SphereNet initially seemed to be do a good job at, uh, at separating these enantiomers, uh, rotating the, these chemical bonds, which doesn't actually change the chirality of these conformers, actually causes the model to confuse which conformers correspond to which enantiomers uh, shown by the overlapping of these clusters. So what we may want to achieve then is to actually force a model to be invariant to these confounding bond rotations, thereby increasing the model's ability to learn chirality from the molecule's 3D structure. And so this would effectively cause all those different conformers to collapse to the same point in the encoded latent space. And as a result, the model will really isolate different latent representations for different enantiomers, uh, uh, where each latent, each latent representation is, essen is essentially a distinct chemical representation capturing that molecule's chiral identity. And so this is kind of the core guiding principle behind, behind our model. So kind of the goal for designing, okay. for designing, oh, yep. One question before you move on. So um, in the previous slide, yeah, what we are showing here, basically you are invariant to, at least you force the model to have very different representation for two different um, chiral um, 
two different NHML, but at the same time, you force different conformation to map to the same representation. Yeah, so, and uh, so go ahead. So isn't that kind of um, very, very much different from the effect? We, we still want the different, from one particular NHML, we still want to have different mapping for the different conformers while we separate the, the NHMRIC uh, structure. Yes, if that's right. Uh, I'm not sure I quite understood the question there, um, but I'll, I'll kind of reiterate that what we want to do is that we each want to achieve separate latent representations for different enantiomers because we want to capture how the different chirality actually affects the different molecular identity of these enantiomers. So we want, we want to achieve the separation between these enantiomers. Um, and because we're kind of learning chirality from 3D structure, um, if we use 3D graph neural networks, such as SphereNet, to kind of learn this difference between uh, these enantiomers from the 3D structure, uh, this plot is showing how uh, all the conformational changes between different conformers uh, will, will inhibit that model's ability to learn chiral differences from 3D structure, if that makes sense. I'm not, not sure if that answered your question. Um, that actually makes sense. My, my worry is that in what you are showing here, you are actually, uh, the different conformers map to the same representation yes. in the latest yes. case. And that also might be a, a loss of information somehow, right? It definitely so, is. So that's kind of my, my concern. It definitely is. So um, you wouldn't use kind of this in interroto invariance if you were interested in modeling conformational properties or conformer dependent properties. So as energies in QM9 data set, these are very uh, specific to, uh, to the particular conformation. Um, they're also invariant to chirality, but that's a separate point. Um, but yeah, so you wouldn't kind of use this interroto invariance if you're modeling kind of uh, properties that are very dependent on a particular 3D structure, that's correct. Okay. And so th th does that mean that we, we, will we won't be able to have a model that actually do both uh, separate different conformers, but also be sensible enough to, different, to differentiate between different initiatives? Uh, that's a great research question. Uh, so I think that's um, something that uh, me or other people should be actively interested in is how can we develop 3D models that are very sensitive to both chirality as well as individual structural changes. Uh, but that's kind of separate from this work. Okay, cool, thank you. Uh, Dominique? Yeah, so uh, by doing this kind of rotation invariance, uh, the model that you're developing starts to look a lot more like the 2D graph neural networks, where you learn, like, because the 2D graph neural networks are all, also mm -hmm. uh, invariance to the rotation. And the only added benefit here seems to be like this, um, um, like the fact that it can better handle the chirality. The, chirality. the, the question that I want to ask here, like since we lose a lot of information regarding the 3D structure by doing that, uh, it seems that like, at least to me, it seems that there are not a significant advantage. Maybe I'm wrong, like we have to see the next slides, but there are not necessarily significant advantage compared to using a 2D graph. And I was wondering if there would be maybe a way of introducing some sort of uh, pseudo invariance where uh, the model is not necessarily invariant to uh, the torsion angles and the uh, interroto invariance, but has the ability, for example, um, by combining the representation of a interroto invariant and a non interroto invariant uh, representation having the model learn to decide how to balance both of them or not necessarily learn to decide, but maybe we can decide predefined weights such that the model can really decide like, okay, I want to map uh, rotations that are um, rotations that are close to each other. I want still to be able to differentiate them from rotations that are far from the original uh, conformer, but with, again, the gain ability of like uh, being able to, to deal with the chirality? Yeah, so great questions. I, I will say you're completely right in your first point that this interroto invariance is really modeling a, or sort of a two and a half D 
representation of a molecule. It's not fully 2D because 2D doesn't naturally capture kind of the chirality, which is a 3D structural element, but it's not fully 3D in that it's not capturing all the, the 3D uh, structural information or structural changes that can affect uh, different conformers. So it's somewhere in the middle. Um, but I think that's okay because a lot of uh, chiral properties are really properties of the entire molecule and not necessarily of a particular 3D structure. So you're gaining the ability to more robustly uh, model uh, chirality in an in a, in a, in otherwise normally 2D graphical network, which I'll also come back to in the later slides. As to your second point, um, I think there's a lot there, but I think a, a very interesting point of my eventual model is that this inter variance is bond specific. Uh, we can be inter invariant towards a particular bond of the molecule, but we can uh, you could imagine not being interrode invariant to a to another bond in the molecule. So you have this potentially have this control over uh, which bonds you want to um, you essentially want to collapse that rotation to or be invariant to that particular uh, rotation. Um, so I think it gives you a lot of uh, 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 modeling opportunities, and that's one of the reasons why you want to introduce this interrode invariance as something we want we could we can we can start to think about in molecular modeling opportunities. So, so is this something that you decide in advance which bond you want to be roto invariant to, or like uh, is not it learned? Not in this uh, in, in in this current construction. We kind of just did everything as simple as possible. Every single bond has this inter invariance property, kind of naturally integrated into it. Okay, perfect. So I I'm, I'm looking to see how it performs compared to two D graph, probably yeah. in the later slides. Yeah. We'll get to that at the end. Uh, Yashwa. Yeah, uh, it's more of a comment. Um, I uh, and maybe responding to uh, the previous questions. It seems to me very important to distinguish the chirality from the uh, rotations, uh, and and the reason is the chirality has to do with uh, how the molecule was constructed in the first place, uh, whereas the uh, rotations is something that happens, you know, once it's constructed, and then you know it, it's going to go to different conformations, and and they play would play a different role. Um, so you, I, I think it's super important to distinguish these two things. Yeah, completely agree. <laughs> that's that's what I mean. It's just a comment. Thanks for it. Uh, I let you go. Thanks. Uh... Okay, so hopefully as we go into the rest of this talk, we'll kind of address some of the, these questions again in more, in more detail. So with this kind of motivation, the overall goal for designing our model has been to leverage torsion angles and specifically coupled torsion angles to kind of bake in a novel invariance to internal bond rotations directly into a neural architecture. And then through this, uh, learn an expressive representation of tetrahedral chirality from the 3D molecular structures via those same coupled torsion angles. And so not to kind of spoil a punchline, but that is exactly what we've done with uh, this model. Uh, kind of the, the following visualization kind of shows how we've managed to bake in this interroto invariance uh, by considering the coupled torsions of a molecular structure. And by coupled torsions, I really just mean torsions that co-vary with the rotation of a bond and thus those torsions that cannot be independently changed in a confirmation. So starting with this simple molecular uh, uh, conformer shown here, we can look down this central carbon-carbon bond in a side view to draw a Newman projection where we can clearly define the coupled torsions psi A, psi B, and psi C. And now if we rotate the central carbon-carbon bond by some rotation angle R, uh, then each of these torsions will rotate together because they're coupled. And so for each rotation angle, we can compute the sine or the cosine of the rotated torsions, uh, which essentially yields a set of sinusoids uh, for each torsion as a function of that rotation angle r. Then if we, if we compute a weighted sum of the cosines and sines of these rotated dihedrals and plot the summed cosines against the summed sines, and this actually forms a perfect circle in the sine cosine space. And this is important because the radius of the circle is invariant to however which way we rotate that central bond. Therefore, if we just encode this radius for that internal molecular bond, rather than encoding each torsion individually, then we can bake in this inter invariance directly into the model. <laughs> 
But how does this actually help us distinguish chiral enantiomers? In fact, in this kind of current construction, uh, two, enantiomers, two enantiomers with inverted uh, chiral centers will actually have the same exact radius of the circle in the sine cosine space. So in order to learn chirality, we need to break the symmetry by adding just a little, little bit of complexity uh, to this formulation. And specifically, we can break the symmetry by adding learned phase shifts to each of the coupled torsions that share the same molecular bond. So in other words, by having a neural network learn or predict a phase shift for each of these coupled torsions, we can actually induce kind of different degrees of wave interference for these different enantiomers when we sum up those sines and cosines. And as a result, the radii of these circles will actually differ for different enantiomers. Um, so we can, uh, by encoding these radiuses, we can uh, distinguish between different enantiomers while still, uh, while still encoding and integrating this, this in invariance to, to, bond, to bond rotations. Uh, so I know this geometric formulation can seem a bit complicated, but it's really the driving principle uh, technical principle behind our model. So behind our model. So I'll just kind of briefly pause here to let everyone kind of digest what's happening and also answer kind of any quick clarifying questions about kind of this fundamental geometric idea uh, behind our work. Uh, there's a brief question. Where do you take from, the phi, where do you take the phi i from? Uh, so notation there's psi i and phi i. The psi i are just the torsions that you get from molecular structure. The phi i are, are actually predicted from a neural network. So I'll go into a little bit of the math in later slides, but it's, it's, it's learned from the 2D representations. And geometrically, where is phi? I don't see it in the picture. I don't get it. Oh, 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 oh I see. Uh, phi is just being represented in these, in these, in these shiftings of these, of these sinusoids, essentially. Um, If that makes sense. It's really just a phase shift for each of these sinusoids. So it's the amount of shift that you would obtain if you do what? Uh, it's not really a phi, the, the phi eyes aren't, aren't really physical. They're more just, they're just learned by the network in order to learn chirality. Uh, <clears throat> but it's really just a mathematical way of kind of breaking the symmetry between when you sum up these sinusoids, you get this kind of wave interference. Uh, if you think about it physically, it doesn't really make sense. It's really what really happens when you add these phase shifts is that you're essentially kind of distorting the bond angles, which doesn't really make too much sense. But the, the important thing to uh, important thing is that when you kind of physically distort these bond angles based on these phase shifts, you distort the bond angles differently for different enantiomers. So it allows the network to kind of learn how different uh, uh, perturbations kind of a, a differently affect enantiomers in different ways. Um, that's kind of the, the physical intuition. Okay, but um, there are many phi's that would allow you to distinguish the uh, uh, chiral molecules. So yes. uh, which one is good, right? Uh, yeah, so that's what's learned. So um, the, the the different phi i's will affect the radiuses of these circles. So the mo the model has to learn uh, which which phi's are phi i's are important um, in order to learn the effects of that particular chiral center. Um, there are a couple questions in the chat. Um, Sam asked, "How are the weights chosen?" Those are also um, the, the 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 weight coefficients. In the summer, also predicted by our neural network, uh, which I'll talk about later. And Soror is asking, uh, is R acting as some sort of bias? Uh, um, R is just a representation of what happens when we rotate that central central bond. We don't actually encode R into the network. It's just kind of a representation of, of, of how rotating this bond forms a circle. Hey, um, just a follow-up question. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. OK. So. Do the weights cause the circle uh, cause the graph to be a circle, or is it? Or are they chosen so that it is a circle? I don't really understand that. Uh, right. Uh, the weights you can you can kind of completely ignore the weights. You can all the weights can be one. Everything's still a circle based off of this uh, simple trigonometric trigonometric properties. So these okay. sinusoids all have the same frequency. So that when you sum up these sinusoids, the net wave also has the same frequency, and so it forms a perfect circle. Okay. Thanks. Okay, in interest of time, I think I'll continue. 
Um, but now that we have this kind of geometric scheme of encoding coupled torsions to learn chirality, we've gone ahead and kind of created a neural network that implements this geometric formulation, which I call the chiral interrotto invariant neural network. Uh, at its basic level, Cairo is really just a neural framework for augmenting kind of any 2D graph neural network with additional processing of 3D inter internal coordinates, particularly torsion angles, to kind of learn robust representations of chirality uh, via this interrotto invariance. And algorithmically, Cairo is really just constructed from a 2D message passing a phase, a bond distance and bond angle encoders, which aren't really that important, which I'll, which I'll skip. Um, and then lastly, the most important torsion or chirality encoder, uh, which encodes all the chiral information. And then lastly, a readout phase for property prediction. So the 2D message passing phase is really just a way to embed each atom in the molecule into a learned feature representation or node state that is only dependent on the 2D graph connectivity. And since I already touched on kind of 2D graph neural networks earlier in the background part of this talk, I think it suffices to say that just we can use kind of any off the shelf 2D graph neural network to encode each atom in the molecule into a node representation. And importantly, we will embed these node states using only the 2D graph structure without any 3D geometry or chiral information at all. Um, I think we can skip these bond distance and bond angle encoders. Um, they're really just for completeness, but don't actually contribute much um, to the kind of theoretical or empirical motivations behind the work. Um, so next on the docket is really the torsion encoder, which is kind of our core contribution and where all the magic of Cairo happens. And while the architecture shown on the left uh, may seem to be a bit complex, it is really nothing more than a, kind of a neural network implementation of the geometric uh, torsional processing scheme that I kind of discussed, that we, that we discussed earlier. Um, and so hopefully this will clear up some of the kind of mathematical questions people might have about how we actually uh, go about encoding, uh, encoding this interrotor invariance. So the first thing that we're going to do um, in our torsion encoder is learn the weight coefficients that we use to take that weighted average of the coupled torsions for a given internal molecular bond. And so we're going to predict these weight coefficients by simply concatenating the four node representations of the atoms i, x, y, and j that form a particular torsion angle. We're going to feed this concatenated uh, node state uh, through a feedforward network that just predicts a scalar weight uh, for that particular torsion. Nothing fancy going on here. And then we're going to actually do nearly the exact same thing in order to actually predict the phase shift angles for each of the coupled torsions. And importantly, these phase shifts are actually a 2D property. If that makes it, they're only predicted from 2D information. And so these phase shifts are really just a way to break the symmetry of the 3D information that comes in in the dihedrals. But when we're actually predicting or learning these phase shifts, uh, we just learn it from the 2D information. And so with these weight coefficients, phase shifts, and our 3D torsions in hand, we can then simply compute those weighted sums of those phase shifted sines and cosines. And that's just a simple summation. And then we can take the radius of, the, of those circles or the amplitudes of those, sims, of those summed sinusoids and encode this radius of each internal molecular bond into a separate latent vector describing that particular bond. And so we're going to concatenate the node representations of X and Y, as well as the, the, the radius uh, for that particular uh, bond X, Y. We're going to encode this into a separate latent vector and then sum pool uh, all these latent vectors to give a single latent embedding of, of the coupled torsions uh, in that conformer. And that's essentially all there is to the torsion encoder. Uh, so now that we have the kind of this latent vector uh, embedding uh, for the torsions, as well as uh, for, uh, for the distances and bond angles, which I didn't describe, uh, but is, is very similar, uh, we can go ahead and actually predict some chiral molecular properties in a readout phase. Uh, so specifically what we're going to do is we're going to sum pool over all the 2D node states and concatenate the sum pooled uh, molecular embedding with the conformer latent vectors describing the distances, angles, and in, in particular the torsion or the torsion angles or chirality information um, of, a, of a molecule and concatenate this, conca and feed this entire concatenated molecular representation into another simple feed for a neural network to predict a target value 
And these target values could be either binary class labels for, for binary classification, or they could be docking scores if we want to predict binding activities, or they can really just be any sort of chiral sensitive property of the molecule. Um, there's another question in the chat from Henry, but uh, I will answer this uh, uh, come later slides. Um, and so, yeah, that's essentially all there is to the architecture of Cairo. Um, really just a, a way to augment a 2D graph neural network with additional torsion of processing. Uh, Yashua, you have a question? Yes. Um, maybe I missed something in your uh, explanation here, but it looks like we're trying to predict Carol properties starting from just the 2D graph. So how could that possibly work? So we, we start from the 2D graph, uh, the CMP, you can ignore that, uh, but we also uh, concatenate with this, um, this latent vector that is, is pulled from all the torsional processing or the chiral processing of the information. You mean Z is a latent variable or you- Yeah, Z is I a latent. Z was a function. Oh, Z is a latent variable. Yes, Z is a-, a, is a No, but it's not, no, it's not. It's a, it's a deterministic function of the H's, which is a deterministic function of the 2D graph. Uh, almost. So these H's are again, learned by the graph neural network, but we, we include the, the, the torsions here in this in the summation. So this is where the 3D information comes in. Oh, okay. So the phi, the phi's, so where do we get those phi's from then? The, the phi's here are learned. Uh, they're the property of the 2D network. No, I'm sorry, the psi, the psi, where, where are the psi's coming from? The size come from any conf any three D conformer structure that is kind of inputted to the model. So it's just from a, okay, any, any so, confirmation. Okay. Okay. So we pick one of the confirmations, yep. and then that gives us the psi, and we also have the regular two D graph, and that's mm -hmm. going to give us the prediction for the chiral properties. Exactly. And it's going to be invariant to which confirmation we chose. That's what you're Ex saying. Exactly. It doesn't matter. Uh, up to like differences right. in bond distance or bond angles. Got it. Makes a lot of sense. Um, I have a, <clears throat> a follow up question. So, if you walk us through kind of one uh, carrot center, where do we start to have differences in the in the pre computed values? Is it great from question. the. Uh, yeah. yeah, great question. So, um, I think this comes to a, a particular a detailed point that chirality is really a node centric property. It really describes the orientations around a particular node. Well, what I've really just described are bond centric properties. Um, uh, which, so essentially for a chiral center, which ha may have four separate bonds around it, we kind of do this, in, this processing for each one of those, each one of those bonds separately. Um, uh, and so that's where, so each one of those, essentially these latent vectors for this particular bond are going to capture some chirality of that bond. Um, it's just kind of a modeling choice. So we can do both as inter invariance while also capturing chirality. That's a good point. You could, you can imagine you could, uh, feed that the, uh, we can additionally process these individual bond embeddings and feed this information back into node states to kind of model uh, the chiral information, information as, as node properties. But uh, we found that it doesn't really matter. We can just sample these uh, uh, in a simpler way. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, so, Uh, with this new model, we can actually evaluate the ability of Cairo to learn these expressive chiral, chiral representations in three experiments that are sensitive to molecular chirality. The first one I've actually kind of foreshadowed, but it's, a, it's a, just a self-supervised contrastive learning experiment that simply attempts to distinguish conformers of different stereoisomers inside a learned latent space more of an empirical demonstration. Uh, the next task will use an experimental data set from Reaxis to classify how enantiomers rotate circularly polarized light in different directions. And lastly, we have kind of curated a data set of simulated docking scores for small enantiomers in an enantiomer sensitive protein pocket in order to challenge the model to rank enantiomers by their simulated binding affinities in a chiral external environment. Uh, so for this first task, we train the model to simply cluster conformers of the same chiral molecular identity in, in, inside an encoded latent space, while simultaneously being able to distinguish conformers that belong to different stereoisomers. And while I won't really go into the technical training details, we, we can achieve or learn this task by using just a contrastive learning objective uh, by a really simple uh, triplet margin loss. Uh, 
So shown here are kind of the results of how Cairo, Schnet, DimeNet, and SphereNet all cluster conformers of a pair of enantiomers in my test set inside this learned latent space. So you'll first notice that Cairo perfectly separates uh, or clusters these different conformers for these different uh, enantiomers. And SphereNet also, do, also does an, uh, a pretty good job, at least initially. This is something I kind of showed earlier in this talk. And although Schnet and DimeNet uh, do a, definitely a worse job, you may be easily fooled into thinking that Schnet and DimeNet actually have some ability to, to, to separate stereoisomers. Uh, to show that this is actually not the case, we can perturb or transform these conformers in, in, in illuminating ways and see how these models fare in reclustering the transformed conformers. Uh, so the first tr transformation that we can do is that we can reflect each of these chiral conformers uh, through, through a mirror plane, which as we know, will invert the chiral identity. And we can analyze if the models can still separate enantiomers after, mirror, after reflecting these conformers. And as it turns out, um, because Schnett and Diamond are E3 invariant, they are completely fooled by this simple transformation, uh, kind of emphasizing uh, the inability of E3 invariant networks to properly distinguish enantiomers. For a second transformation, we can rotate bonds near the chiral centers in order to change the molecular, molecular conformations without actually altering the underlying chiral identity. And notably, as I, as I, as I touched on early in this talk, uh, doing this causes SphereNet, which is an SE3 invariant model, to confuse which conformers belong to which enantiomer, kind of visually shown by the overlapping of these enantiomers clusters. Uh, Importantly, Cairo's interrotor invariance makes Cairo invariant to all those confounding bond rotations, and thus Cairo maintains perfect separation between these clusters of enantiomers. Uh, for a more quantitative test of chiral expressivity, we evaluate the ability of these models to predict how enantiomers rotate circularly polarized light. And while many kind of experimental properties of enantiomers are actually the same, enantiomers will rotate circularly polarized light in different directions. And so we can attempt to train our network to predict the sign of optical rotation for different enantiomers. And for this task, we compare Cairo to SphereNet, as well as to a variety of 2D baselines that kind of, that have been previously, previously been developed to model the effects of chirality from kind of 2D information, as Prudencio kind of mentioned earlier on in the talk. And so in addition to kind of great, greatly outperforming the SE3 invariant model SphereNet, Chiral also outmatches these 2D baselines indicating that our inter-rotor inter, inter invariant 3D representation of chirality is more powerful than these other 2D representations of chirality. Um, uh, and then for a third task, we evaluate the ability of the models to correctly rank enantiomers by their simulated binding affinities or docking spores to a chiral protein pocket. And here again, Cairo achieves the best performance when the ranking in the enantiomers by their docking spores, kind of achieve, achieving similar performance gains over our 2D and 3D baselines. Uh, but that kind of sums up all the, all, everything I want to talk about today. So just to kind of, uh, to conclude, uh, we've developed Cairo, which is the chiral interrotor invariant neural network that kind of introduces a technique of processing 3D torsion angles to one, learn an expressive representation of, of tachyhedral chirality and do this by integrating an invariance to rotations about internal molecular bonds directly into the, into the model architecture, thereby kind of explicitly considering conformational flexibility inside the model. And empirically, we have seen that Cairo achieves this kind of state-of-the-art performance in learning chiral representations of chiral molecules compared to 2, 2D GNM baselines, as well as E3 or SE3 invariant 3D graph neural networks across a variety of tasks. And I want to note that although we have kind of chosen a particular model architecture, Cairo is highly adaptable and it's really just based off that torsional processing scheme. And it's kind of also completely agnostic to the, the, to the choice of message passing of graph neural network. So you can, uh, this means that you, you can easily integrate, integrate Cairo into any current or future graph neural network in order to improve that network's expressivity toward tetrahedral chirality. And you can find our full paper on archive. It was also published at iClear 2022. And our code and data sets can be found on my personal GitHub. With that, I'd just like to thank everyone for listening. And special thanks to the team at Valence and M2D2 for inviting me to discuss my work. I'd like to acknowledge my advisor, Connor, as well as my incredible co-author, uh, Lucky Patnik, and of course, um, my research group.
And with that, I'll be happy to answer any uh, any more detailed questions about this work. And I'll also be on the Slack channel af afterwards to answer any follow-ups. But yeah, I can take questions now. Well, thank you for the great talk. It was uh, super interesting and uh, I think very novel to see like this kind of um, roto invariance. And this is where I think like your experience uh, background more in chemistry helps compared to the math background of uh, many machine learning practitioners. Um, I have a few questions like regarding the, the docking score prediction. Yep. Um, so one of the problems with using sphere net is that uh, the conformer that you use for the prediction is not necessarily the conformer that, that is uh, relevant to the task. And I guess this is why Cairo works so well because it can adapt the conformer to, to the situation. Uh, but here for docking, uh, for docking a specific conformer is used uh, to compute the score. And did you use the exact same conformer uh, that was used in the docking simulation or did you just use any like low energy conformer uh, that, that other methods gave you? Great question. Um... So, yeah, uh, we're here. We're treating docking score more as a more of a stereoisomer level property, less so as a conformer dependent property. So we're not using the confirmations of the of the bound ligands. Uh, we're using just confirmations we pull from our dataset popgun 3D. Um, and so, you're right that SphereNet is really tuned into kind of modeling the actual 3D elements. And so, to maybe offset that fact, we've trained these models with a little bit of data augmentation where we train on both, uh, I think, around uh, five to 10 conformers of each, um, of each, I think five conformers of each uh, enantiomer and that are all given the same exact docking score. And so that's what this Cairo versus this Cairo one conformer is. Uh, Cairo and SphereNet are trained on kind of uh, five examples, five conformers of each enantiomer, all with, all with having the same chain training label. Whereas this one conformer is where you only use a pre-selected, a single pre-selected conformer that again is not related to the bound pose. And so um, this kind of demonstrates that Cairo does not need this data augmentation to perform well. It performs equivalently. While SphereNet um, in, in this task as well as, well as in the, in, in the uh, other task uh, suffers when we don't use this data augmentation. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. I would expect SphereNet to perform better in the case of uh if you know the exactly gone conformer, but then you can just do the docking and having yes. the prediction is not, is not necessary, right? right. <laughs> um, also a question regarding the separation of uh, the, um, the different chirality um, from sphere net. I was wondering if like, um, here you show that if you do lots of rotations, then the kind of clouds become start to intersect each other. But I was wondering if that effect happens because you're doing any kind of rotation or if that effect is also visible if you take only the low energy conformers. So I did I did not screen for low, particularly low energy conformers in this simple experiment. It was more of a kind of empirical demonstration of kind of the, the, uh, the theoretic motivations behind our work. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, limiting that to low energy confirmations would still uh, allow the separation. Um, I imagine that maybe maybe the clusters will be more well-defined, but you still have this issue of different representations for different conformers of different enantiomers. Um, and I think on each of these uh, class, in these, each of these tasks, we are using kind of uh, uh, PubChem 3D or RDKit conformers, which are, you know, not super low energy and they're not DFT optimized, but you know, there are, there are reasonable structures and it, and it doesn't seem to, uh, it, uh, these uh, sphere net still doesn't perform as well, but okay. that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, thanks a lot for your answers and uh, thanks again for the great talk. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, there's a few questions in the, in the chat. Uh, we can take those and in the book. Okay. I see two questions. One from Henry, beyond the chirality, would it make sense to use this model without the size for an interrotin 
inter-rotation variant representation as a drop-in for 2D representations. Um, so, I mean, you could just take out the phi's and uh, the phi's are what really makes a model able to learn chirality. So if you kind of drop those from the network, you really just reduce chiro to, to, an, to, a, to a simple 2D graph uh, network. And we, you, you use a 2D graph neural network to embed the node states. So um, I, yeah, I guess it's kind of like a, 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 a strictly more expressive 2D graph neural network, but I don't think that's uh, particularly like uh, insightful because we can just use any sort of off-the-shelf 2D graph neural network. We're not doing anything special with the, within, with the node embeddings besides um, processing the chiral information, if that answers that question. Um, because kind of 2D graph neural networks are naturally in into roto invariant because they don't model 3D geometry. Um, and so I don't know if Henry's still here, but. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, it, it, it isn't, isn't your representation slightly better uh, since there is some notion of um, uh, von Lenz, von Engels, and yes, also right. um, the, the relative torsions of, uh, uh, so th there is kind of like some 3D information that is not in a normal 2D graph representation. So I was wondering if that was rich enough. Sure, sure, I understand. Uh, so we haven't really evaluated uh, Cairo without the chiral information on just kind of like molecule net properties or like typical things, benchmarks that are used to benchmark 2D graph networks. So that's, not, that's not something we're particularly interested in. And I think, I think it depends on how you particularly use the bond distance and bond angle information. I don't think we use that in a, in a particularly uh, like uh, interesting way. It was more just a, more, for, more for completion. And I think there are kind of new ways you can, uh, new graph neural networks kind of coming out all the time that may be more suited uh, for that. But you're right that bond distances and bond angles don't really change conformer to conformer. So there's really should be no issue with, uh, with augmenting a 2D graph neural network with that kind of, with that bond distance and bond angle information, which is naturally interroad invariant um, because it doesn't, it do, does, doesn't change conformer to conformer too much. Okay, thank you. And then there's another question, does Cairo take into account the, the enantiomers of one, two dying like compounds? Um, okay, one, two dying, I'm trying to look at this. Oh, so like, uh, I'm trying to think of this question is, is concerned about multiple chiral centers or of a particular of like a, of cis trans isomers because our model is not well suited towards cis trans isomers um, or cis trans stereo isomers. Um, that's something we have to think about down the road. We're really focusing on tetra to chirality, but our model is absolutely, absolutely able to think about um, molecules with multiple chiral centers, multiple tetra to chiral centers. And Emmanuel, maybe you could ask your question out loud. I don't think I fully understand the application. Uh, thanks for the, uh, for the talk. I was just wondering like, whether you have thought about uh, using Cairo for uh, resume. So like when you have a measure of both type of enantiomer and you might be wondering about, uh, I think it's quite common in drug discovery. And, I think that there might be some kind of application of chiral for that. Uh, so racemins are mixtures of enantiomers, and you're saying, what do you want to do with those racemins? Uh, I would think maybe like in terms of like a, a prediction of uh, uh, some form of activity. So that might be something that might be measured experimentally and maybe using chiral for predicting the Okay, so, so predicting properties of racemate mixtures. Um, I would actually think if you don't know which enantiomer in that racemate mixture is actually contributing mostly to, to, to the property of interest, that's like you're kind of you're kind of blind to that information. I imagine maybe just a 2D model that kind of naturally models that uncertainty might be a better choice than trying to model a particular uh, chirality, but I it's an interesting question. Um, one that I haven't really thought too much about because I feel like uh, that, yeah, um, 
Yeah, I guess it depends. Here I have a question. Um, first off, I want to say I remember reading this when the, the preprint came out uh, and my group really liked it a lot. So really great work, especially the chemists. Uh, they liked it quite a bit. Uh, the way that you handle torsion. And torsion is a huge deal, right, in chemistry. And it's it's often completely ignored. Um, and and the way that, that you handled it, they, they liked quite a bit. Um, I, I have sort of a two-part question that are highly related. The one is... Uh, you know, sort of what is the practical application of this in drug discovery? Like completely ignoring the the, the beauty of it, you know, from a, a research perspective, I, I think it's, it's really great. Um, and the second part is, is really, you know, it feels like the biggest challenges with, you know, machine learning drug discovery is either scalability. And if you have to generate any confirmations at all, it becomes significant, significantly less scalable. Sure. And then, you know, basically predicting binding or, or highly confirmation dependent properties, uh, in which case it would seem like you need really not an invariance, but an equivariance where it is, you know, easily predictable how it's going to react to different enantiomers. Um, so I, I just really like to get your thoughts on, on that. Yeah. Uh, for practical application, that is a question that we, I think, uh, thought a lot about and struggled with, mainly because there's not a lot of data sets out there that uh, are very sensitive to chirality or have a lot of examples of that have kind of label properties for both um, both enantiomers that so you need to you need you need that information to learn how the chirality is going to affect that property. So I think how it can be applied really depends on what data is available, um, especially with like docking scores or any kind of binding of any other bioactivity assays. Um, they are going to be sensitive to chirality. Of course, two enantiomers could have different bioactivities, uh, but bioactivities are also sensitive to a lot of just molecular uh, uh, properties as well. And I, and I wouldn't think that maybe in like a drug discovery campaign, you're not going to be testing kind of both enantiomers of every single compound you're evaluating. And so uh, it might be hard for the network to have enough signal from the training data or uh, to kind of learn how chirality affects that property of interest. So I think it, it goes back to how you're designing your experiments and um, what you're focusing on, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious if you can see any applications for this where it would be better usage than like an equivariant network where you you do have confirmational information, but it's, it's you know, very specific to, to what the model learns. Equivariance in what fashion, like a... a... So you can imagine that, you know, something like a tensor field network uh, mm -hmm. could probably, I haven't thought much about this because the question just came to me, you know, yep. as we were giving a talk, but... Uh, it seems like with the second degree um, uh, harmonics that they use, you could encode torsion mm -hmm. and therefore have torsion specific predictions, but it would be much more computationally intensive. However, it would probably be more useful for something like docking score prediction or, or binding affinity prediction, where it's not, you don't want it to be totally invariant to the confirmation, you know, you, even though it's got torsion information baked in, you want it to be very specific to the confirmation or the, the distribution of confirmations. And therefore the fact that it is sensitive to a confirmation and not invariant to the confirmation, um, but that you don't have to train it with every single confirmation because of the equivariance layers, um, that might be more appropriate for that despite being more computationally expensive. Yeah, so I think there's a couple points. I With any sort of equivariant, networks out there, tensor field networks, equivariant graphical networks, there's a lot of them. Um, I think they're equivariant to kind of global transformation. So they're equivariant to global translations, global rotations, or global reflections in some cases. And uh, that doesn't mean they're equivariant to local changes in the conformer. Um, they're not equivariant to internal bond rotations, which is something I'm interested in. Uh, so they're, they're not changing in predict predictable ways towards these local changes. So um, at least not that I don't, that I'm not familiar with it at all. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, you're, you definitely hit on the point that Cairo is not to be used for kind of predicting properties that are very conformer specific. That is not something that we that we focused on in this work because it is essentially a two and a half D model um, or two D model with chiral uh, expressivity. Um, so you're right there. I think it really depends on what property you're, you're trying to model what data you're modeling that from. If you're modeling from a bound ligand state, then maybe, yes, you probably want to use the actual 3D information in that bound pose rather than sort of any conformer pose. There's more information there. 